this was not a choice of a game selection for me. I can only focus on two. There were other options, but with about 10 or 11 minutes left, I thought, okay, I've got to get to this one. And that's what I saw. And what I saw was Miller Moss running for his life, throwing the ball out of bounds continuously. Offensive line pass pro issues popped up and reared their ugly head again. That's right. And, you know, when things go off the rails, when the, when a season goes wrong, people want it. They're not necessarily most people, but you always find a faction of a fan base. Uh, you, you know, it, it's not always a majority. In some cases, it's just a vocal minority that wants the coach fired and wants the quarterback to be changed. And that that latter part, like I can understand people being fed up with Lincoln Riley. Like it's it's year three and we're not seeing overall progress i mean it's better than last year but like you as i wrote over the weekend at trojans wire you know usc is playing catch up that might not be the thing that anyone around the program wants to hear it's certainly not what fans want to hear but that's reality like 2023 put this program behind the eight ball it undid a lot of progress from 2022 recruiting portal pickups like just 2023 damaged the program's brand and reputation and you saw the lack of depth right as soon as anthony lucas gets hurt with eric gentry already being out and the defense did really well without eric gentry uh being on the field for the first 50 minutes and bear alexander's not in there because he left the program defense did a great job in those first 50 minutes but then you add anthony lucas and that was like the straw that broke the camel's back right so that that's one part of all this and then the other part is with Miller Moss, we said it all along. He needed help, you know, because he's not Caleb Williams, and that's not a criticism either. It's just Miller Moss cannot put on his cape and go win a ball game by himself the way Caleb Williams sometimes did, sometimes could for USC. Miller Moss needed all his teammates to be there for him, and on the offensive line with that Minnesota outside pass rush, getting to Miller Moss on that third and four, hitting his arm, causing an interception. That's not Miller Moss's fault. That is uh, the pass protection breaking down. He did not have a chance on that play. It becomes an interception as opposed to an incomplete pass. And then that shorthanded defense without Anthony Lucas, credit Minnesota for you know taking advantage of attrition. USC did not have as many quality bodies as it needed. And just the, game, the, the tidal wave swamped the Trojans in the final 10 minutes. And I go back to this point of emphasis one more time. Lead by 10, lead by 14, so that one huge mistake doesn't cause the whole house to come tumbling down. It's what we saw against Michigan, right? The big run at the end of the game, it cost USC because USC was up by only four. And by the way, that Michigan team that USC lost to, Washington handled them. And so that loss to Michigan now looks even worse. So you can't be playing these tight one-score games against relatively average teams. Minnesota is not a bad team, but no one would call Minnesota an elite team. No one would call Michigan this year an elite team. You should be 10, 14 points better so that a big mistake, a key injury, you know, one tipping point factor doesn't just swamp everything. And that's where USC is. And so the final point before we bring in Marty for the Penn State perspective is that Lincoln Riley went to the well. And I mean, you hear coach all sorts of coaches do this. Like we're just two plays away from being undefeated, you know. We're 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 right there. We're so close. No one wants to hear that, Lincoln. No one. No one wants to hear you talk about how close USC is. You know, if USC had come, had, was one play away from beating 2023 Michigan, you know, a national championship level team. If USC was one play away from beating Ohio State or Oregon, a top three team. Okay, different conversation. But Minnesota and 2024 Michigan are bang on average teams. No one wants to hear about how you came so close to beating average teams. And so that's a bunch of Clay Helton, sunshine pumping, idiocy. Lincoln Riley should know better. I just can't stand it when he tries to spin highly negative situations into positives because there's not much positive right now at USC. And Lincoln Riley needs to level with his fan base. 
A lot of USC fans think Lincoln Riley's play calling uh, is not cutting it. And I think to a certain degree, that's true. I, I think in the Minnesota game, though, just to address this point, you know, on the, the series of downs that led to the interception that changed the game, USC ran on first and 10, ran on second and five, and the interception occurred on third and four. I, I didn't see Lincoln Riley abandoning the run. Now, if you wanted to say, you know what, third and four, Minnesota 36-yard line, you should run there. Uh, and then, you know, knowing that you can still go for him fourth down, I mean, yes. But, like, the fact that an interception occurred on that play doesn't mean that it was dumb to pass on third and four. I don't think you can say that. And I don't think you can say Lincoln Riley went away from the run. USC was running the ball fairly consistently and, again, ran the ball first and second down on that series of downs when the game-changing interception occurred. It's not as though USC passed on the two plays before uh, the interception. But but Lincoln Riley is obviously not calling his plays in such a way to adjust for the weaknesses of the offensive line. Like you'd think Lincoln Riley would know, okay, I have limitations here, so let me call plays that adjust to my offensive line's limitations on that on that count yes lincoln riley's play calling uh ha has not measured up so i so i hope my prediction is wrong for this week yeah now determining the five and a half point spread and navigating that is a different deal certainly but uh yeah I'm i will take in. i will take penn state minus the five and a half okay okay I mean, I, you know, I, my predicted score for the USC Minnesota game was USC 30, Minnesota 23. So USC by seven. So I had the Gophers plus the eight. So, you know, that hit because the, the main thing with USC is this you can't give the benefit of the doubt to a team that hasn't earned it. And that's why I took Minnesota plus the eight, plus the eight and a half, whatever the line ended up being. Like USC has to prove it's a really good team before you start betting on that team against the spread and you give that team the benefit of the doubt. USC has to earn it. It's that simple. You know, so if USC goes out and beats Penn State outright, I will then you know, re revisit and rethink uh, how I treat USC relative to any uh, betting lines. But, but certainly for this game, I'm thinking, yeah, Penn State should at least be able to win by a touchdown. Again, I hope I'm loudly, horribly wrong, but I think that's pretty clear cut from what I've seen. I really wrestled with that eight point spread and I finally opted for USC. I just thought, okay, I can see this being a really tight, tight game, but that USC's skill position advantage, I thought that they would break off a couple big plays in the fourth quarter and widen that gap and maybe get it done by 10 or 13 points. Didn't happen. Were you, how surprised were you that they lost the game? Uh, somewhat. Uh, but like, I'm, I'm certainly not surprised it was close. And that, that, that's the recurring theme that USC is playing to the level of its competition. Every game is, is pretty close. If not at the end, certainly through three quarters and you just can't keep living on that tightrope, right? You, you, USC needs to be, uh, getting two touchdowns, 17 point leads. Now it finished the Wisconsin game with a 17 point advantage, but that was a late Mason Cobb uh, interception for a little bit of window dressing. Obviously that game was much closer than the final 17 point tally. Um, like USC just needs to be gaining separation and it really hasn't gained separation in any non Utah state game uh, this season. So, you know, the just at, at, like Bill Parcell said, what your record, your record is what, what, uh, you are what your record says you are, you know, right? And 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 I would just extend that. Your patterns say what kind of team you are. So until USC breaks from some of these patterns, I, like I can't say I was, I can't say I was absolutely stunned about the loss. But certainly when USC was leading 17-10 at the Minnesota 36, third and four, I'm thinking, all right, now we should put this game away. This should be a W, but. Like USC and its offensive line in crunch time on, in these Big Ten road games has fallen apart. Remember when USC had the ball with the uh, four-point lead against Michigan, five minutes left, the offensive line just gets caved in. 
And Lincoln Riley's play calls were not great. But you know what? When your offensive line is not playing well in big crunch time situations, you know, it's let's say this, folks, everyone watching here at the Boys of College Football, Riley's play calling has definitely not been the best, but you need this offensive line to play better. Like you need that marriage. You need a marriage of your play selection and your offensive linemen doing their job. It's both. We shouldn't put it all in one basket. It's both. The play calling is going to get better if the offensive line becomes more consistent. And the and the 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 inconvenient and very lamentable truth about this offensive line played an outstanding third quarter again. Like this offensive line has played so well in third quarters all season long. If the offensive line can play so well in third quarters specifically, it was really solid in that third quarter at Michigan, really solid coming out of the blocks against Wisconsin. And that USC offensive line was mashing against Minnesota. USC was rearing back and finally just pounding the rock, pounding the rock, 12 play, 91 yard, uh, seven minute touchdown drive, the best USC drive of the whole season. You know, you're seeing moments when this offensive line plays well, but the fact that it plays well, so well in third quarters makes the, the bad first halves, the sloppy first quarters, and then the rickety closing stretches in these Michigan and Minnesota games. It makes it all the more uh, puzzling and, and annoying that why can't this offensive line play well for at least, forget 60, all right, 45 minutes would be a significant improvement. Right now, this is a 25 to 30 minute offensive line. It, it, it has played really good football for about 25 to 30 minutes in most of its games. You know, tossing aside Utah State, the cupcake. Uh, you know, if, if, why, if you can play 25 to 30 good minutes, can you at least play 45 good minutes? I mean, for, and, and for, again, forget about 60 for now. Let's, let's get 45 good minutes, three good quarters from this USC offensive line. And let's see how far this team can go. Because, like, I'm not, I'm not expecting 60 complete minutes from this line. Let's see if it can get to 45. 45 good minutes. Let's see how far USC can go with that. Let's see if it's going to be enough uh, against Penn State. We'll, we'll all find out. But, uh, yeah, like Josh Henson – He's very much on the hot seat. If, if USC's offensive line gets dump trucked by Penn State, for me, that's it. That, that's it. Like, we have to see something really special against Penn State, and then we need to see progress, clear, consistent progress over the second half of the season if there is to be even a chance, even any remote chance that Josh Henson gets retained. Because, and I wrote about this at Trojans Wire too. Josh Henson is in the Alex Grinch zone, and I'm not talking just about the hot seat. I'm talking about just the fundamental point. At some, at some point in a coach's tenure, you realize he is not the best this team, school, NFL organization, whatever, can do. Josh Henson is not the best USC can do as offensive line coach. And so when you realize that this position coach is not the best you can do, that is the point at which you say, Goodbye. We need to start fresh. We need to get a skull crusher. We need to get someone better uh, to come in. So unless we see a really strong performance, and I'm going to grade that by the metric I just uh, raised a little bit earlier, can we get 45 quality minutes? I'd love 60, but I'm not going to expect that, given what we've seen so far. Can we get three strong quarters from this offensive line against Penn State? And if, and if we can't, and, and it all comes crashing down in a third in a third loss, like bye bye, you know. And when, when USC and Lincoln Riley will need to find a better answer at that position. I'll end it this way on my side, folks. Think about this: How many times during a long, long college football offseason do we go through the schedule and review the schedule at nauseum because it's so interesting to think about the matchups? And we do this with every team, and we basically have a three category system of. Well, that's a win. That's a win. That's a win. That's a win. And then uh, that's if it's a team of USC's caliber, it's typically not definite losses, but it's that's going to be a tough one to get. That's going to be. And then there's these, yeah, 50 50 games somewhere in the middle. Well, Minnesota, Minnesota was such a check mark win to the point that 
last week, besides having our guest on, we kind of brushed it aside, started well, start talking about Penn State already. Let's talk about some Penn State, and that Penn State game is going to be something else, and that's going to be huge. And I will say this. How many times during this offseason, Matt, have I said this? Once USC gets past Michigan one way or the other, which, of course, it was a loss, do they have this string of games in the Big Ten? And none of them outside of Penn State look impressive. They don't. Rutgers, Nebraska, Minnesota, Wisconsin, etc. But I said the week after week of that dull grind, that pounding, that don't be surprised if there's a loss or two in there. And there's already been one. And there are the Nebraskas and Rutgers coming up. I don't know. And that and that road trip to Seattle for Washington, like I'm not optimistic about that one at this point. Like Washington was able to beat Michigan solidly uh, and USC couldn't beat Michigan. So, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And and I think one one nuance just to kind of dovetail on that is that, you know, having an off week in mid-September, this was not good for this team. I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying you really do not want to have an off week as early as USC had it. You want to get several weeks of momentum and rhythm with your team. You want you don't want to play two games and then and then, you know, pump the brakes and then have to kind of restart. You want your off week in October. You want to play at least a month of football to get rhythm, uh, you know, to, to kind of just get a feel for how everyone relates to each other. Uh, this is not it. Uh, now, now I'm, I'm not saying that the Big Ten wronged USC. I am merely talking about the dynamics uh, and structure of a of a favorable schedule. A favorable schedule gives you a, a an off week in October in the middle of the season. Uh, like USC has not. U, USC had better rhythm before its mid September off week than it did after. Uh, and again, not an excuse. I'm just explaining the mechanics and structure. Uh, of the schedule. So we'll, we'll see if now USC, as we get into the middle of October and this seven game stretch from Michigan on the September 21st through Washington on November 2nd, let, let's see if USC actually does begin to develop more cohesion as the season gets uh, later and as we get into late October, early November. Let's see.